less than two years. All young women, almost all raped and strangled. One suspect, Henry Lewis Wallace. Police have stopped him sooner. Tonight, bodies of evidence. The Wallace investigation. Good evening, I'm Tom Burlington. All 10 of these women are dead. Some were friends and co-workers. Some were college students. Some were young mothers. All but one of them knew Henry Wallace. Yet, Charlotte investigators never connected their murders until victim eight, Brandy Henderson, was found strangled. A WBTV News investigation shows police could have, if not should have, connected all 10 of these cases much sooner. Tonight, you'll hear from nationally recognized experts in homicide who are critical of the murder investigations done by Charlotte Mecklenburg Police. I believe that there was professional malpractice in these cases. He basically killed the same way every time that he killed, and nobody was able to pick up on that. It's very scary. We've got a problem here, you know, and it's almost like, are you going to have to be knocked in the head with a sledgehammer? D. Sumters led the charge against Charlotte Homicide, saying the department didn't do its job, didn't see a pattern of strangulations that began with her daughter, Shauna Hawk. Here they had, everything was right here all along. It's been right here. And they've done everything except look right here. He was questioned. In the first the police news conference. The investigators worked uh, tremendously hard and did an excellent job on the investigation of all of these 10 cases. But even police were asking themselves, how did this happen? And the only thing that I can say is that we're sorry that we did not get him identified earlier. Uh, had we done that, then uh, we maybe could have saved the lives of some of these women. I'm angry. I'm mad. Because I feel like if they would have did a better job, she would have still been here. And I can't help but think that had they moved a little bit faster, that there's a small possibility that my sister Deborah would not be dead. The second police news conference. The excellent work of our department brought this case to a closure within 48 hours of the identification of the primary suspect. But by that time, the primary suspect had allegedly murdered 10 women in Charlotte. This was Henry Wallace after hours of police interrogation. This is Henry Wallace after graduating high school in Barnwell, South Carolina. And most of his alleged victims knew this Henry, a well-spoken 28-year-old who sailed with the Navy. He worked in Charlotte area fast food restaurants where he met many of his alleged victims. Victim one is 33-year-old Sharon Nance, found beaten to death in May 1992. One month later, 20-year-old Caroline Love disappears, walking home from this Bojangles where she worked. Eight months after Love, police find a third victim, 20-year-old Shauna Hawk, the first woman strangled. Paramedics tried to resuscitate Shauna. That was February 1993. Henry Wallace allegedly choked the life from her petite 104-pound body with the strength of a 240-pound man. Four months later, 24-year-old Audrey Spain found strangled in her own home. Less than a month and a half later, on August 10, 1993, 21-year-old Valencia Jumper, dead in her burned apartment. Authorities ruled her death an accident, but in fact, Valencia, too, was strangled. Another month goes by, and victim six, 20-year-old Michelle Stinson, she's found strangled and stabbed to death in her apartment. Victim seven is found on February 20th, 1994, 25-year-old Vanessa Mack, the fourth Charlotte woman police found strangled in her home in just one year. And just two and a half weeks later, the Strangler's final three victims are found. Victim eight is 18-year-old Brandy Henderson, found strangled March 9th. The next day, 24-year-old Betty Balkum, also strangled. 
Then two days later, March 12th, victim 10, 35-year-old Deborah Slaughter, found strangled in her home. And on this day, the killing stopped when police arrested Henry Wallace. It's very unfortunate that uh, we were not able to identify him early on. Unfortunate, to be sure. Now, you've already heard from one expert we spoke with, and he used the word malpractice. And another FBI-trained homicide investigator we spoke with characterizes one aspect of the Shauna Hawk investigation as negligence of the highest degree. Another homicide expert says Charlotte investigators missed an obvious serial murder pattern. My fair and objective assessment is that this pattern should have been recognized in 1993. Vernon Gebberth is a 23-year veteran of the New York police. He's also recognized nationally for his textbook, Practical Homicide Investigation. It's considered the Bible for homicide detectives. He retired as commander of Bronx, New York Homicide Task Force. Commander Gebberth says Charlotte police missed linking the strangulations. Now, victim one, Sharon Nance, was not strangled. She was beaten to death. And Caroline Love's body was never found until police say Henry Wallace confessed. But you're about to hear some experts explain why police should have linked the deaths of Shauna Hawk, Audrey Spain, Michelle Stinson, and Vanessa Mack to one killer. A killer who allegedly strangled Shauna Hawk first. We had devotion that day, and uh, uh, it was on a Friday evening, and uh, it was a fairly good day. And uh, then a phone call came, and uh, it was Dee on the other end, and she was quite hysterical, uh, saying, Walter, Walter, uh, you've got to come to Charlotte. Something has happened to Shauna. Police said Shauna was strangled by a killer who meticulously removed nearly every clue and left no fingerprints. But Commander Gebberth says such a clean crime scene should have aroused suspicion. We have a female black strangled in her home, no forced entry. Uh, that's not the norm. Not the norm. And yet, just four months later, Charlotte police would find a second young black woman. Audrey Spain is found strangled in her home. And as with Shauna Hawk, there's no sign of a break-in. When it was followed with Audrey Spain, there were enough circumstances that a light and bell should have gone off in Charlotte Homicide. The FBI-trained homicide expert we contacted agrees. He has 21 years in law enforcement, 18 of those as a detective. He's also a criminal profiler trained by the FBI who specializes in homicides. His superiors wouldn't allow him to comment about this case on camera, but he told us by phone, quote, after just two strangulations, I certainly would have linked this to one person with just the strangulation aspect. No question about it. Three months later, a third woman is found stabbed to death and strangled. When Michelle Stinson was killed on September 15, 1993, at that point you had a full-blown serial murder pattern. No question about no it. No question about it. This was a full-blown pattern. This, at this point, the authorities in Charlotte should have been aware that they had a major problem on their hands. But Charlotte police told us strangulation deaths are not that uncommon, and these cases did not arouse suspicion. The national average 10% of all homicides are strangulation, so it's not that unique to have three of them. But Sanders is quoting national figures. In North Carolina, less than 3% of all murders were strangulations in 1991. In 1990, the number is about 2.5%, and in 89, it's 4%. Three female blacks strangled in their home, no forced entry. That's bad. That's real bad. That would immediately point to a stalker. That would be a geographical, a local killer because of the condensed spread of the homicides. You know you're dealing with one offender from the local area. The investigative antennae of a modestly uh, experienced forensic pathologist and homicide detective should have been uh, quivering. I really do believe that. Yet five months after Michelle Stinson's death, Vanessa Mack is found strangled. Mack's death brought the total number of Charlotte women strangled to four in exactly one year. At that point, bells and alarms should have been going because now what we have is not three but four and they all are similar. Charlotte police apparently saw nothing 
Yet the experts see even more clues that should have set alarms ringing in Charlotte homicide. Several clues are in the autopsies of these women, the first women police found strangled. Their clues, the experts say, could have pointed police to one killer. More on that in a moment. And I can't get the image out of my head of someone having something around her neck and her struggling for her life. I can't get that out of my head. Murder. Investigators are supposed to work closely with the medical examiner. In Mecklenburg County, that's Dr. Michael Sullivan. He conducted the autopsies on every victim in this case. But the experts who reviewed the autopsies of these five women say they should have raised red flags for Charlotte investigators, especially Valencia Jumper's autopsy. It says she died in a fire. But the autopsy was wrong. Valencia Jumper was strangled. The autopsy is very important, uh, but we depend on the medical examiner to do that. The autopsies are signed by Dr. Michael Sullivan. He ruled Shauna Hawk and Audrey Spain were strangled, and there are obvious signs of strangulation in Michelle Stinson's death. But Charlotte police saw no similarities. There wasn't no distinctive characteristics to say these three were connected. So WBTV News reviewed the autopsies detailing the first four strangulations. We brought our questions back to Acting Chief Boger. But when you get down to actually examining the circumstances of the crime, there are more dissimilarities than there are similarities there. And so you're telling me there was nothing in the autopsies either to, to link them? I have read the autopsy reports, but I'm told by the, by the people who did, the officers who handled those cases, that there was, there was nothing there to link them. The autopsies of these women give graphic descriptions of how they died. Now, when you think of strangulation, you probably think of hands closing in around the throat. That's described in Shauna Hawk's autopsy. But the other autopsies clearly state a ligature was used to strangle these three women. A ligature can be anything from a piece of rope to clothing. Henry Wallace is accused of wrapping clothing like this around the neck of each victim to strangle the life out of them from Audrey Spain's autopsy. There is a ligature fashioned out of what appears to be a previously torn t-shirt intertwined with a black brassiere wrapped tightly around the neck, visibly compressing and pinching the skin with the bra knotted in a double knot. Michelle Stinson's autopsy clearly states ligature strangulation. And when Vanessa Mack was found, there was a white long sleeve pullover type shirt fashioned as a ligature around the neck. I pointed out these similarities to Chief Boger. Again, ligature strangulation. Right. How could they miss that? I don't have an answer for that. It should have been obvious, says Dr. Wecht, who is both a forensic pathologist and a licensed attorney. We're not talking about people that commit crimes. We're talking about negligence, simple, ordinary negligence, a deviation, a departure from acceptable and expected standards of care. Uh, same thing for lawyers, architects, engineers, et cetera. That's the definition of malpractice. And what I think we're dealing with here is professional malpractice. Dr. Cyril Weck began his career as a pathologist in 1961, and since 1973, he's been chairman of the pathology department and chief pathologist at St. Francis Central Hospital here in Pittsburgh. After I sent him these autopsies of Henry Wallace's alleged strangulation victims, he agreed to talk with me about them and about the importance of the findings to the Wallace investigation. I'm not saying that these people did anything criminal or that they were uh, totally ignorant or that they are incompetent in their fields. Uh, this may be a very good forensic pathologist and they may be very good homicide detectives. I'm talking about these cases. That's all I'm talking about. And I must say, based upon my own experience and my understanding of the criminal investigative processes in our country, I believe that there was professional malpractice in these cases. At the point when this becomes public, at the point we go to court, come back and ask me the same question. Why do you say that? I, because at that time, the full details will be available. We can talk about all aspects of these cases, and I think we can answer these questions and any others you might have. Dr. Wecht is also a well-known author. He wrote this book about 12 autopsies he's dealt with personally. Reviewing or so on John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, uh, Gene Harris, Mary Jo Kopechny, Sonny Von Bulow, Jeffrey McDonald, Elvis Presley. 
Dr. Wecht has serious questions about another autopsy in this case. He was surprised to find the Mecklenburg medical examiner concluded Valencia Jumper died of burns in an accidental apartment fire. I was even more surprised uh, when I saw that the case had been signed out as um, a fire death. And I was absolutely incredulous when I then learned that they continued to stick with that diagnosis even when they got back the essentially negative carbon monoxide uh, report from the toxicology lab. He's incredulous because that negative carbon monoxide report means there was no CO or smoke in Valencia Jumper's lungs when she died. The autopsy also shows there was no soot in Jumper's throat. Now, right away, I got to wonder, gee, no soot in the presence of a fire, how can that be? And then when I get back a negative CO finding, now I got to immediately realize this is not a fire death. Only after police arrested Henry Wallace did the medical examiner change Jumper's cause of death to strangulation. So how does the Mecklenburg medical examiner explain his ruling Jumper's death accidental? Dr. Mike Sullivan won't talk on camera, but by phone he told me, quote, I relied on Charlotte fire investigators. In Jumper's autopsy, Sullivan writes, preliminary information from fire investigators is the fire appeared to be accidental, with indications Jumper may have collapsed back onto her bed after standing up in superheated air. The fire investigator, Mike Davis, wouldn't talk about this case on camera. Chief Charlotte fire investigator David Lowry won't either. But he told me by phone, quote, superheated air can kill someone without leaving traces of carbon monoxide in the lungs or soot in the throat, and I've seen this often, unquote. Dr. Weck has problems with both explanations. Sit up from her bed and so on, uh, you know, that's, I don't want to be uh, too, too harsh here. Uh, let me say that it is, um, uh, I think, uh, unscientific and invalid as it is applied to this particular case. Both Dr. Wecht and a second pathologist agree. Superheated air is usually found in blast furnaces and large chemical explosions, rarely apartment fires. That second forensic pathologist, Dr. Rudiger Breitnicker of Baltimore says, I don't know how they came to this conclusion from the recorded evidence in the autopsy. I could not come to this conclusion because a check for carbon monoxide is elementary and it behooves a medical examiner to find out why it's not present in a fire death. If this case then had been recognized and considered even as a possible additional strangulation occurring within a period of uh, six months or so, who knows? Had Dr. Sullivan found the correct cause of Valencia Jumper's death, he and investigators in Charlotte would have realized they had not four strangulations, but five in one year. Dr. Wecht also has questions for police who say they found few clues at the scene of each strangulation. Let us assume then that such thorough, meticulous examinations were done at the scenes of these uh, cases, and they should have been, I would expect that, in Charlotte in 93 and 94, I would expect nothing less. Then they found nothing. Now that really makes the antennae go higher. The periscope shoots up more and begins to look all around because now you say, hey, what's going on here? We got women who are being murdered and we're not finding anything? That leads you even more in the direction of a serial killer, of someone who is doing this methodically, repetitively, and in similar, almost identical fashion. The experts we've consulted agree. Charlotte homicide investigators and the medical examiner should have suspected these five women were strangled by just one killer. Yet there's an even bigger question. Should investigators have been able to link the strangulations to Henry Wallace before these three women died? Again, our experts say yes. We'll touch. Tonight you've heard from families who've lost loved ones, a mother, father, sister, and cousin who say Charlotte police should have stopped Henry Wallace sooner. Our experts say the clues pointed to one killer, but did they point to Henry Wallace? You have somebody, however, who has selected a certain kind of victim, young black women. Uh, you've got uh, somebody who has chosen the modality by which he will kill them, namely strangulation. 
and uh, you have somebody who has opted for whatever reason not to beat them up and uh, not to physically assault them in a sexual fashion. Rape charges didn't surface until Henry Wallace was arrested, and there is no evidence of sexual assault in any of the strangulation autopsies. But that in itself, our experts say, still points to one killer, though not his name. Investigators did question Henry Wallace when victim two, Caroline Love, disappeared in June 1992. Wallace was dating Caroline's roommate. There was nothing in our missing person investigation that indicated that uh, he had anything to do with her disappearance. But had investigators thoroughly looked at the next murder, the experts feel Henry Wallace's name may have surfaced again. Wallace hired Shauna Hawk for a job at this Taco Bell, and he even dated her once. But not long after her murder, Shauna's family had a question for police. Have you checked out people at the school? Have you checked out people at her job? Uh, they, though, would always answer, yes, we're checking that, uh, but they never really did. Police appear to confirm that in their second news conference. A couple of these cases, had we gone to the workplace, we might have found something we didn't find until much later. Our FBI-trained homicide investigator states, if you're telling me a college co-ed was found murdered and no one questioned her co-workers and friends and classmates, that is negligence of the highest degree. It's germane to doing a competent investigation. Yet the next victim, Audrey Spain, also worked with Henry Wallace, and like Shauna Hawk, at Taco Bell. If the police had looked at these two, they would have seen they both worked at a Taco Bell. They were both worked at fast food restaurants. Maybe, just maybe, someone was targeting gals who worked at a fast food restaurant. And the next victim, Vanessa Mack, also worked with Henry Wallace at Taco Bell. In none of these cases did anything we gathered at the scene or from people who knew these victims lead us to their workplace. Our FBI-trained investigator asks, where else do you go? You have to ask those people. Was she having any problems at school or work? Any unwanted advances, strange phone calls, any change in habits? This is very hard to believe. This is sad. I don't understand why any of these uh, friends, associates, and fellow workers weren't interviewed. That's, that's homicide 101. That's, that's right out of the book, okay? That has nothing to do with race. That's, that's police error, major police error. Do you think Wallace's name should have come up in this investigation a lot sooner? Yes, Wallace should have emerged earlier as a possible suspect. To date, Charlotte police say they find virtually nothing to criticize. All these cases were professionally and competently handled. The, the, uh, there was nothing given short shrift. There was nothing quickly done. They were, you know, the leads were developed and pursued to the logical conclusion. The head of North Carolina's NAACP is asking the U.S. Justice Department for an independent review. Steger is against any independent review of Charlotte police. I'm really puzzled in such a dynamic, vibrant, progressive uh, community as Charlotte um, that this kind of attitude uh, has been adopted. I, I really find that almost as shocking as um, what we have been discussing about the investigative uh, procedures and um, deficiencies in these uh, death cases. It can't hurt anything. If they really feel like they did everything they could do in this investigation, then there shouldn't be anything to hide. They've done an exceptionally good job, an outstanding job, and we're going to stand on that. Who do they think they are? Do they can stand back and say, we are satisfied. We have reviewed it internally. We don't need anybody else to come in here. We have determined that we have not made any mistakes. Think about that. Is that what you want in every medical malpractice case? Then let the doctors take care of each and every case themselves in the hospital. Every case of alleged police brutality and so on. Then let the police deal with it solely by themselves. Every case involving lawyers in malpractice, let the lawyers and the bar associations deal with it. Think about it. Dr. Wecht and the other experts gave us a lot to think about tonight. In part, they say, to help ensure a murder spree like this never happens again in Charlotte. You've heard these experts criticize Charlotte police, but we'd like you to remember they were talking about homicide investigators, not the officers on patrol. The men in charge say an independent review is not necessary because investigators did competent work.
Kelly Alexander just sent the NAACP's request for an independent review of police procedure to the Justice Department, and he's awaiting a response. One thing is certain, investigators did not know all 10 cases were linked until Henry Wallace allegedly confessed. Wallace is still in solitary confinement and a trial date has not been set. This story will continue and WBTV will be following each development. Good night.